Welcome. Welcome, everybody. My name's David Wood. I chair London Futurists. It's sometimes said that to have good foresight, it helps to have good hindsight. The subject we're talking about today, cancer, used to be taboo. It used to be something that polite society would hardly mention. And indeed, it used to be the case that if somebody wasn't fortunate enough to have cancer, that was hardly mentioned. And even the person involved might not be informed. After all, what could they do with such terrible news? Even heads of state. In 1951, the head of state of the United Kingdom, King George VI, who had been smoking all his life, had various health problems, and his doctors determined that he had a large tumor in his lung, which needed to be removed. But it seems that almost nobody was told about this, and even the king himself may not have been informed, so much so that his death a few months later from complications from the surgery took almost everybody by surprise. Fast forward 20 years to 1971 and another head of state, this time in the USA, Richard Nixon, changed that public discussion. Instead of cancer being something that was never mentioned, he wanted to mention it a lot. It was his vision that his presidency would be remembered for a moonshot of sorts, referring back to what his predecessor as president, John F. Kennedy, had done 10 years earlier in 1961 with the announcement of an audacious, bold collaboration to bring together huge numbers of scientists and engineers to create the Apollo rocket, which would somehow, through means still to be decided in 1961, send human astronauts all the way to the moon, land them on the moon, collect rocks from the moon, and bring them back safely to Earth. And eight years later, in 1969, that audacious moonshot was successful. Well, Nixon was interested in a similar huge project of his own. And in that, he was inspired by what various cancer doctors were telling him. Cancer doctors had made some, it seemed, remarkable progress in the years before, especially treating childhood leukemia with something called chemotherapy, which had got lots of attention. And some of the doctors behind that had wanted to raise the profile of cancer. They had taken out advertisements in the New York Times and other prominent newspapers saying, Mr. Nixon, you can cure cancer. Why don't we set it as a target to cure cancer by the 200th anniversary of the founding of the United States. Those of you who are good at maths and history will know that referred to 1976. And those of you who know a bit about history will realize that grand vision did not succeed by 1976. Indeed, there were a higher proportion dying of cancer than 1971, despite Richard Nixon having triggered lots of funding and organized a grand coalition of different players. 20 years later, the rate of deaths of cancer was still going up. Well, that was the past. What about the future? What might happen in another 50 years? After all, it is 50 years since that declaration by Richard Nixon. In 50 years time, are we still likely to be wondering how this disease of cancer might be comprehensively tamed? Or might there already be significant changes within perhaps the five-year time period that some of these earlier doctors had talked about? Well, to tell us about some of these possibilities, to bring us up to date with some of the changes in understanding about cancer that have taken place, I'll be welcoming in a moment Dr. Kat Arney, who has written a fascinating book, called Rebel Cell, which I strongly recommend to everybody on this call, everybody watching the video afterwards. It made me in almost every chapter have an aha realization as different aspects of the big picture of cancer were tied together. Dr. Arne got her PhD in biology at the University of Cambridge, since did some postdoctoral research at Imperial College, and then has spent more than a decade working in science communication, communicating aspects of the developments of science, its promise and its drawbacks, its issues and risks in roles such as at the Cancer Research UK. So I'm now going to hand over to Kat and she's going to introduce the subject before we get down into deep dive discussion. Thanks Kat. Thanks very much, David. I uh, hope everyone can hear me okay and see me okay. And um, thank you very much for having me. 
So, uh, yeah, my name's Dr. Kat Arney. I'm going to talk you through just a few of the ideas in my new book, Rebel Cell. It is uh, quite a packed book. There's lots and lots to unpack in there. So there's going to be so many things that I'm sure that I will miss out that you'll be like, oh, what about that? And the answer is probably it's in the book. So um, before we have anything more, I'm going to share my screen and hopefully that is now working. Um, excellent. Yep. Yeah, thumbs up. Good. So there are a few places that I want to start from in this talk. So they're answering some, some really important questions in the field of cancer. So where did cancer come from? What does make it so difficult to treat? And I'm talking here particularly about advanced cancers. And then how can we beat it? How can we bring this sort of vision of the cure for cancer or, or make cancer a disease that we no longer have to be afraid of? How can we actually make that happen? So when I was writing this book, when you start really digging into the, the science and the history of cancer, it's important to remember that we have made incredible progress. Uh, even in the past decade, maybe even in the past five years, we've made incredible progress. So right now, uh, more than half of people who are diagnosed with cancer in the UK will survive for at least 10 years after their diagnosis. That is a figure that has doubled in my own lifetime. So it's almost this 50-50 figure. If you are an optimist, you'll say this is a glass half full. If you're a pessimist, you'll say, well, this is still a glass half empty. Um, from what I found out writing the book is that we have done an awful lot to bring that glass to that half full point. When you compare back to you know, 50 years ago, when uh, far fewer people did survive cancer and cancers were diagnosed much later, and we really didn't understand a lot about how to, how to detect, how to prevent, or how to treat this disease. So we have made progress, and it's really important to stress that. But increasingly what I'm feeling is that to really get that next 50%, or even to make a significant indent into it, we need to change the way that we view cancer and that we treat cancer and also how we think about preventing cancer. But where I want to start is really by going back to the beginning, because one of the important ideas I wanted to get across in, in Rebel Cell, and I spend a couple of the first few chapters really digging into this, is challenging this conception that many people have, that this idea that cancer is some kind of modern human disease that it's a disease that just affects humans and is the consequence of our modern lifestyles or something like that. And this is absolutely and categorically not true. When we look, we find cancer across all branches of the tree of life. There are a couple of really interesting notable exceptions. Um, comb jellyfish. There are no known examples of cancers in jellyfish. And also sponges seem to be uh, incredibly resistant to developing cancers. But everywhere else we look, cockles, clams, crabs, catfish, cavefish, cod, corals, or, you know, tumors appear in frogs, toads, amphibians, snakes, turtles, tortoises, lizards, birds, all kinds of animals from aardwolves to zebras. We find cancer. And, you know, this idea that cancer is just a disease that affects humans is simply not true. And even when you look at the incidence of cancer, um, when you take out cancers that are caused particularly by smoking, human incidence of cancer is kind of somewhere in the middle from, for animal species. So, you know, apart from some of the things that we do do to ourselves that do not help our cancer risk, we are not unique in the animal kingdom in terms of getting cancer or our risk of cancer. And the, the paper that really blew my mind when I was researching this uh, was a paper from 2014 from um, some researchers who were looking at this creature on the right. And this is something called a hydra. And now these are tiny, tiny little creatures that live in the water. And they're pretty much some of the simplest animals you can get. They've got three different types of cells. They're pretty much a tube uh, with some tentacles on the end. And th that's what they're like. And this paper described a cancer in a hydra. Now the researchers hadn't done anything weird. They, these weren't, you know, hydra living in, being given chemicals or anything nasty like that or genetic manipulations. This was a completely naturally occurring tumor in an organism that is little more than a tube with three different types of cells. So this goes deep. This tells us that cancer is an inherent biological phenomenon that occurs across all multicellular life. 
And this explains why we see evidence of cancer pretty much wherever we look in the fossil record. So we find evidence of cancers in dinosaurs, particularly hadrosaurs, duck-billed dinosaurs. Uh, the week that my book came out back in August, uh, there was a paper that came out that showed a case of osteosarcoma in a dinosaur fossil that was 77 million years old. Uh, there's a 240 million year old fossilized turtle that's been found with evidence of tumors. So this is a very ancient disease. It's a deep biological phenomenon. And so, of course, everywhere we look in human populations, through the records, we find evidence of cancer. Um, there are hundreds of extant known examples of tumours in human populations, everything from rare childhood tumours through to much more common cancers. And the more we look, the more we find. And the more we use tools like CT scanning, like protein analysis, like DNA analysis, we can start to understand that cancer is a disease that has always been with us, and it has also always been with animals. And this goes all the way back to the dawn of multicellularity. So I, I don't really have time to go into this a lot here, but we get to the idea that, you know, to be multicellular, your cells have to kind of enter into a pact that we're going to do our jobs, we're going to proliferate when we need to, we're going to die when we're meant to, we're not going to take more resources than we need, we're going to clear up after ourselves. And this is kind of the importance of, uh, this is what being a multicellular organism enables you to do. You can do more, you can be bigger, you can uh, eat more things, you can grow. You can do all these kinds of things. You can have specialized tissues if you are multicellular compared to being a unicellular organism like a, a bacteria or an amoeba, right? So being multicellular is very useful, which is why multicellularity has evolved and multicellular organisms have evolved of all kinds of wonderful varieties. But to be a multicellular organism, your cells have to live in a kind of society together. And cancer is basically what happens when cells in this cellular society break the rules. They proliferate more than they're meant to. They don't die when they should. They stop doing the jobs they're meant to do. They leave a mess around themselves. They consume more resources than they need to. So, this is really the sort of the breakdown of the, the societal contract in our tissues. And that's where the concept of cancer as a cellular rebellion, the title of the book, comes from. It's really not just exploring cancer as this, this idea we might have of something other, something that just sort of happens or, or comes to us. This is a cellular rebellion that starts from within the tissues of our body. And it's not confined to humans. This can happen wherever we get multicellular organisms, which is why we see cancers in everything from tiny hydra to giant elephants. So cancer is a deep, deep, old, ancient biological phenomenon that arises out of multicellularity. And this is important when we start to think about how to prevent cancer and the way that we talk about cancer and the way that we talk about what causes cancer. Because, you know, I spent um, 12 years of my career working at Cancer Research UK in science communication, talking to a lot of patients, a lot of people affected by cancer or whose loved ones had been affected by cancer. And their questions were always, you know, why me? What, what caused this? What did I do wrong? And we have this narrative in society that, oh, you must have done something. You know, were, were they a smoker? Did you do this? Did you do that? You know, what, we, what can we blame cancer on? And there are certainly things that we know in our lives and in our environments that increase the chances of cells tipping over into this rebellious state. And I'll talk a bit more about why that might happen later. But fundamentally, there is just, it's a biological phenomenon. Even if you lived a completely, and I put this in quotes, pure, you know, completely healthy life, doing nothing wrong, uh, and I'm you know, take that uh, in the spirit in which I mean it, there is a non-zero chance that you would develop cancer. So we cannot pin cancers on just one thing. Oh, you got it because you smoked or you got it because you did that or this. It's an emerging biological phenomenon from our tissues. There are things that we do that might accelerate it. And there are things that we can do to reduce the chances of this happening. But cancer is deep and it's inherent within our multicellular bodies going back through millions of years of evolution. And here's like a fun little thought experiment. This is my kind of late night whiskey thought. Was that, you know, if we ever find evidence of aliens, alien life, and it's multicellular, 
would they also have cancers? And I kind of think, probably, yeah. Like, this is a, a phenomenon that we know emerges in multicellular life. So unless, you know, aliens are exactly like comb jellyfish or sponges, and we don't quite know what their deal is, we don't know why they are so cancer resistant. Um, yeah, I think aliens could get cancer. Discuss. Um, so let's move on to think a bit more about what cancer actually is. So when I was at Cancer Research UK, I used to sit down and do a lot of these explainer pieces. It would be like, what is cancer? And I would always, always, almost always start with the same sentence. You know, cancer starts when a cell picks up genetic mutations and multiplies out of control. And that's this idea of like a rebellious, naughty cell that's somehow gone wrong. So whether these are changes that are caused by something from the outside, or it, most of the time, the changes, the mutations that our cells pick up come from the internal processes of life. Every time your cells divide, every time the DNA is copied that makes new cells in your body, mistakes get introduced. Just the act of like breathing oxygen produces free radicals and all kinds of things that can damage the DNA in our cells. So just being alive damages your DNA. And on top of that, there are the things in us and around us that, that can increase the chances of these mistakes happening, these mutations in the genetic code in our cells that means that our cells go wrong and start multiplying out of control. And if you want to give this kind of a, a fancy scientific name, this kind of model our understanding of cancer, we, we call it the somatic mutation theory. Somatic means of the body, so cells of the body, mutation, genetic changes. And it, it's kind of like this idea of genetic bingo, that you have a cell and it picks up a mistake and it starts to multiply a bit. And then, and then some of those cells pick up some more mistakes and, and they multiply more and maybe they get some new characteristics and then they pick up some more and they start multiplying more and maybe they start spreading. And it's this idea that you've picked up enough genetic changes to kind of win the crappy bingo jackpot and you become a cancer cell. So this is the kind of prevalent idea of cancer that has really embedded in, in science and in research for, for several decades now. This idea that cancer is driven by the accumulation of particular genetic changes. We can call them cancer driver mutations. Um, I'm going to call them cancer mutations, things like that. But it's just about the mutations. And once you've picked up enough mutations, you're going to be a cancer cell, whether you like it or not. Um, and so we kind of have this idea that, that cancer is, is when good cells go bad. They pick up these mistakes and they, and they become naughty cells and they start proliferating out of control and become a cancer. Now, this is all the, the way that we've thought about cancer for a very long time. But, and here's where it gets interesting, is the question of, well, if that's what a cancer is like, then what's normal? Because as scientists, we tend to only look at the disease. We only look at what's gone wrong. We don't look at what's gone right. And now we have the tools that enable us to use DNA sequencing technology, where we can look at, at genes and mutations in tiny, tiny samples of cells. We don't have to have big lumps of tumor and mash them up and, and look for mutations. We can look at tiny samples of normal tissue. And, you know, and this was a really audacious experiment that was done by uh, teams of researchers at the Sanger Institute in Cambridge, who said, all right, let's get hold of some normal tissue and look at what the mutations are like in there. And people were a bit like, well, why would you do that? Like, it's normal, right? Cancers are the ones with the mutations. And they were like, well, you know, let's just do it. We've got a grant, you know, <laughs> off we go. Um, so they looked for some samples of normal tissue and uh, the first place they started looking was the eyelid and this is really interesting skin because it's exposed to the sun but it's a place you don't often put you know loads of sunscreen on your eyelids and you can get eyelid skin from uh, removal of uh, its cosmetic procedure where people get kind of quite uh, baggy skin on their eyelids and they often have it removed just as a simple cosmetic procedure to help with their sight so they went to the local hospital and said you know can we have some of this skin that you're going to put in the bin and the patients were, were like yep fine you know it's just going in the bin knock yourself out and so they started looking at tiny samples across this normal tissue there's no signs of cancer this is just completely normal skin from people from a range of different ages and they discovered that this completely normal skin was a patchwork of mutation many of these mutations and this is important that if we had found them in a cancer 
we would say that that was a cancer mutation, a cancer driver mutation responsible for driving cancer cells. So they, they kind of were like, well, that's interesting that completely normal appearing skin seems to be chock full of these cancer mutations. And they went on and they looked at esophageal tissue, so the, the food pipe that connects your mouth to your stomach. And again, people of different ages, these circles represent kind of little patches of cells with different mutations that if we found them in a cancer, we would say those were cancer driver mutations. And you can see that some of these patches have multiple different mutations in them, but all this tissue was normal. None of these people had esophageal cancer. And you can see on the right, uh, the person who's uh, in their 70s, it's like, this is, this is like the world's most crazy uh, design, you know, 60s curtains kind of thing. But all of those patches represent mutated cells that if we found those mutations in a cancer, we'd say that those were cancers. So this really kind of blows that somatic mutation theory out of the water. Like cancer is not just about the accumulation of mutations. And this also leads us to another interesting thought, is that cancer is rare. Now, this seems absolutely heretical to say, because we all know that cancer is incredibly common. You look around, you know, one in two of us will be diagnosed with cancer at some point in our lifetime. Cancer is incredibly common. And I'm like, yes, it's incredibly common on a population level. But on the level of your body, that is made of trillions of cells that are multiplying millions and millions of times throughout your life, picking up all these mutations, all these changes. And yet any one of us might in our whole lifetime get one, maybe two, maybe if we're very unlucky, three primary cancers emerging, new cancers emerging in a lifetime in our body. That is one times 10 with 14 zeros after it. The odds on this lottery are incredibly small, yet we know that it happens, but it happens very rarely on the scale of our bodies. So this is a bit of a conundrum because rather than cancer being a disease of, you know, our bodies are made of good cells and then some of those cells go bad. Our bodies are kind of made of like sad cells. You know, they've, by the time we're getting to middle age and older, they've all seen some stuff. And writing this book, you know, I'm sort of looking at my skin and like, what's going on in there? You know, my cells have seen some stuff. I'm, I'm in my 40s and, um, and it's only going downhill from here. So, you know, your cells are, are all sad. But the question is, what turns a sad cell into a bad cell? And this is really another of the ideas that I explore in a lot of depth in the book. And there definitely does, there's an increasing evidence emerging that there's some kind of tipping point. That it's not just about the single genetic changes, the single changes in particular genes that are driving cells to become cancer. That there's some kind of more serious catastrophe. And what we're looking at in this picture are chromosomes. Every cell in your body has 23 pairs of chromosomes. And these are long strings of DNA that are packed with genes. And this is what normal chromosomes should look like. Um, if these are taken from someone who's genetically female, um, if you were genetically male, you'd have uh, one X chromosome and one Y chromosome. But this is, uh, this is normal chromosomes. So they're all like nice pairs, everything looks good. Now let's look at some chromosomes from some cancer cells. And these are the chromosomes taken from six different breast cancers. And I hope that, you know, even the non-scientists among you can see that there are some differences here. So there are chromosomes that have been duplicated. There are chromosomes that have gone completely missing. There are chromosomes that have been glued together where they should not be. So there is some kind of chromosomal catastrophe that happens on the road from cells just being sad and kind of, you know, doing their, doing their thing as we go through life to becoming a cancer. We don't know what triggers this. Um, we don't know what encourages it. We don't know why some cells where this happens survive rather than dying. Uh, so these are really active, interesting questions in the field of how do our cells evolve from, from being sad cells, evolving into being bad cancer cells. But we certainly know that this kind of chromosomal chaos is absolute rocket fuel for the evolution of these cells to become aggressive, invasive, cancers.
And we can start to see the, the development of cancer as a kind of evolutionary journey from, from healthy cell to kind of like sad cell to bad cell to aggressive cell. And, and then on ultimately, and I'll talk about this next, to the kind of cancer that is resistant to treatment or comes back after treatment. And we also start to see, and I don't really have time to go into it in a lot of detail here, that it's not just about the chromosomes, the genes, the mutations. Because evolution we know is not just about genes, it's about the environment in which these cells, in this case, or in any situation, um, could be organisms, species. It's not just about the genes, it's about the environment as well. And it's about the environment in this case, the microenvironment of our tissues. Is there a good blood supply? Is there inflammation going on? What are our tissues like? And, you know, tissues where things are all a bit awry, maybe these are the kinds of tissues in which cancer is more likely to emerge. And our tissues do change as we go through life. Um, as we become older, there's more chronic inflammation in our tissues. Our immune system changes. It becomes less effective. The immune system is our body's police that kind of picks off bad cells, things that don't look right. So we need this combination of dodgy genes and a changing environment that is the fuel for evolution by natural selection of cancers in the body. And this is the kind of the idea of survival of the fittest. And this is a, an idea, Darwin's idea, that's often very much misinterpreted to mean, you know, the biggest, the strongest, the best, the toughest. Survival of the fittest means best fit to its environment. So in an environment that's, you know, like uh, young, healthy tissue patrolled by lots of immune cells, low inflammation, dodgy cells don't really get much of a chance because they're not fit in that environment. But as we get older and things start to, to fall apart and go awry, that's an environment where these damaged cells can start to thrive. And this is why cancer is a disease of old age. We see rates of cancer throughout our lifetimes are generally very, very low until we get to our 60s when they start to go up. And this is why it's because the environment in our bodies changes as the cells in our bodies change. And this can help, as I've explained, help us to understand how cancer develops. And as I'm going to go on to talk about, it can tell us why treatment fails. So um, I'm going to show some medical images, probably should have warned you about that. Um, if you're not very into um, seeing that, you might want to stop watching, come back in a couple of minutes. Um, but this is a, a patient, this is a man who has uh, metastatic melanoma, it's a type of skin cancer that has spread through his body. And all these lumps and bumps that you can see are tumours that have grown in his body that where the cancer has spread, set up home and, and is thriving. Now, this person, he was treated with a drug called Vemurafenib. And this is a, one of the first generation of what we call targeted therapies or smart drugs for cancer that were drugs that are designed to target specific genetic changes in cancer cells. Um, the poster child for this kind of drug is, um, is a drug called Gleevec or imatinib, which was developed for a certain type of leukemia. And it's been incredibly successful. It's absolutely transformed the outcome for people with chronic myeloid leukemia. Um, it really, it's, it's now an incredibly survivable disease. Uh, and so the idea was that, right, okay, this is how we're going to treat cancer. We're going to find the mutations. We're going to design drugs that attack and target these mutations. And that's how we're going to get rid of the cancer cells. And some of these drugs are incredibly effective. So this is the same person after 15 weeks of treatment on this drug. And the difference is, is absolutely staggering. So this is you know, a matter of months after starting this treatment. Um, it, it's just incredible. I saw these slides presented at a conference when this was, uh, when, when this was new research and everyone in the audience was just like, oh, wow. Um, the next slide got an even bigger gasp because just eight weeks after this photo was taken, this is where, we're, where, where we are now. This, um, all the cancers, you can see just all the tumors have come back. And at this point, this cancer is now no longer sensitive to this treatment. It's become resistant. And unfortunately, in this case, there are no further treatment options. Now, in many ways, this is how we treat advanced cancers. 
Um, there are different ways that we treat early stage cancers where there is much more opportunity for cure or for, for very long term control. Um, and different types of cancers have different rates of success. But when we're talking about advanced cancers that have spread through the body, this is a recurrent story. So someone will have treatment, it will seem very, very successful, sometimes for months, sometimes for, for years. And then the treatment stops working and the cancer comes back. And if you are very lucky, maybe there will be another treatment. And then maybe if you're very, very lucky, there'll be another treatment. One of the people I speak to in the book, my friend Crispian, is now on his fourth line of treatment for very advanced kidney cancer. You know, he has survived far longer than anyone expected because he survived to the point where the next drug is available. But the way I describe it is really, it's, we're sort of playing whack-a-mole here, is that we're treating with a drug, we're waiting for the cancer to come back, and then we're treating with another drug. And at some point, you are out of options. So the question is, well, if this is a process of evolution, so the, what's happening here is that all the cells that are sensitive to this drug are being killed by, them, uh, by it. But somewhere in there, because there are so many genetic changes in these cancer cells, somewhere in there are cells that are resistant to the treatment. And they will just keep on growing. And ultimately, they will grow to a point where you can see that the cancer has come back. So how do we win this game? You know, how do we get some kind of advantage or control over this evolution? We know now that cancer is an evolutionary phenomenon. And that if we are treating advanced cancer, where there's lots and lots of genetic diversity, lots of different types of cells in there, then you're basically applying a selective pressure and it's only gonna work for so long. So how can we be smarter using evolutionary principles? And uh, one of the people who I think is most interesting in this area is this man. This is Bob Gattenby. He's from the uh, Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa in Florida. And I went out to see him because he is a mathematician. Now, maths is not my strong point. Very disappointed to discover that maths may play a big role in um, finding better treatments for cancer, but here we are. Um, but he and his team, they are employing mathematical modeling, evolutionary understanding to understand how we can really take this evolutionary journey that cancers are going on and use it to our advantage. And the inspiration for this was uh, he read an article about the diamondback moth. Now, this is a moth uh, that's agricultural pest, very widespread in the US. And it's become resistant to every pesticide that people can throw at it because people have just indiscriminately treated these fields to get rid of the moth. And the ones that survive are the ones that are resistant to the pesticide and they will grow again and then you've got to use another treatment you've got to use another pesticide and farmers have recognized that this is a problem and so they now have to think about a process called it's called integrated pest management where you have to kind of like not try and get rid of every single moth you have to work out what's an acceptable level of damage how do we control the levels of these pests without trying to eradicate everything and without running the risk that these pests will become resistant to the treatments and become overwhelming. And he was like, well, this is the same problem we have with treating advanced cancer, because we know that we have resistant cells and we have sensitive cells. And that ultimately, if we take away all the sensitive cells, the only ones that are left are the resistant ones and they will grow again. And so this is the kind of way that, that these cancers are treated. So in this picture, the purple cells are the ones that are sensitive to a drug, are the ones that are resistant to a drug. And there's just going to be naturally, naturally occurring mutations in a diverse enough tumour. Tumours are like a patchwork, a heterogeneous mix of genetically different cells. So once a tumour has got to a certain size, there will be cells in there that will just carry mutations that enable them to resist a treatment. So you give a treatment, you give a big dose of a treatment, this MTD means maximum tolerated dose. You get rid of pretty much all the sensitive cells. You treat again, they're all gone. What have we got left? We have cells that are resistant to the treatment. And you can treat again, and you can treat again, and it's not going to make a difference. Those cells are going to come back because they are now resistant to the therapy. And then you have to hope that you have a second line of therapy to try after that. Um, what Bob is doing is saying, well, okay, we know this happens. 
So instead of trying to get rid of every single sensitive cell, what we know is that sensitive cells actually have an advantage over drug resistant cells and they can kind of suppress them. It's like kind of having rival gangs in a city, right? You know, these, these, these cells are kind of argy barging against each other, right? So the sensitive cells can actually suppress the resistant cells. So you treat people, but not with a massive dose. You treat them to a point where their cancer is shrinking, but there are still, it's, it's still there. And you assume that there are still some sensitive cells there and then you stop the treatment. So you don't wait until there's no trace of cancer left. You stop the treatment and you wait and the cancer grows again. But the cells that are growing back are ones that are sensitive to your drug. And so you treat again and you go through these cycles because the sensitive cells are suppressing the resistant cells. You're not applying this really strong selective pressure that's only going to leave resistant cells in there. And he's been doing this. He started off testing this approach in, in mice um, with great success and then moved into clinical trials in humans. The first trial was in prostate cancer. Um, and he had really incredible success here. So the men in the trial, this is advanced prostate cancer, men being treated with a drug called abiraterone. And the average time that men will be on this drug before they get to this point where um, the cancer has just come back and it's resistant is usually 18 months. And he has had men that have been on these cycles of treatment and release for over four years. And overall, they've had long periods where they haven't been on treatment. They've had less drug overall, so they've had fewer side effects and a better quality of life. So I think it's, you know, if this was a new drug, people would be banging down the door. There should be headlines everywhere about this approach. You know, when we see the headlines about new, holy grail, amazing drug, it's like, this is an existing drug. It's just being used in a much smarter way. And I, I think it's really phenomenal. Um, we, are, uh, Bob and, and his team and others around the world are trying this kind of approach in other types of cancer. The important thing is you have to have a way of monitoring the burden of disease because the way that this works is you kind of, you treat, you wait for the cancer to get to a certain amount. In, in the first trial, it was down to kind of 50% of what it was. And then you let it come back and then you treat again. So you have to be able to monitor how much cancer is there in the body. You have to have some understanding of how these populations of cells, resistant cells and sensitive cells are reacting and responding, how they're working and the sort of relationship between them. But unfortunately, we do see that resistance ultimately does emerge. You know, you can't keep these resistant cells suppressed forever. So the next thing is, it's like, well, if we can use these kind of approaches to sort of control cancer, for much longer. If you're thinking about this as a way of like, okay, how do we eradicate a population? You're really talking about an extinction strategy. And, um, you know, and we know a lot about how to drive populations extinct because we can see this all the time on earth. We are driving genetically diverse populations down to extinction. And um, an example that Bob picks up in one of his papers talking about this idea is the heath hen. Now, heath hens, uh, they were found very widely in the uh, eastern, uh, sort of top eastern, northeast of the US. Uh, when the uh, colonialists arrived, um, they, uh, they hunted these birds. They're kind of about the size of a turkey. And there's some idea that maybe the original Thanksgiving turkey was a heath hen. So there was a lot of hunting and the habitat started to shrink as colonial expansion, the expansion of, of the settlers in the US took over and then, and then over the years, more and more people, the habitat shrink for these birds. And in the end, they're down to a very small breeding population just on Martha's Vineyard. And uh, this population, because it's so small, it has very low genetic diversity. And this means that it doesn't have a lot of kind of genetic material to evolve itself out of trouble. There was a fire, very unexpected event, a fire on the breeding ground for these birds. There were several harsh winters in quick succession. And then finally, there was a disease that wiped out the last one. And the last heath hen, Booming Ben, um, it's so rare, he had his own name. Um, he died in 1932, and that was the end of the heath hen. So if we're thinking about this kind of idea of how do we drive cancers to extinction in the body, then we can see that we need different types of threats applied at different times, but at the right time. You know, if there's a disease that goes through a large population that's very genetically diverse, 
you've probably got a good chance that there's going to be animals in there that are resistant to the disease. So, you know, it might reduce the population, but they will come back. If you have animals over a large enough breeding ground, you know, a small fire in one place isn't going to make that much of a difference in the long term. So when we think about applying this to treating cancer, already we do use things like combination therapies. We use uh, different types of treatments with different approaches that hit different types of processes in cancer cells. But we don't really think a lot about what are we actually trying to achieve. And where this has actually been, uh, been put to good use is in the treatment of childhood leukemias. And it was completely come upon by accident. So this is the work of Sidney Farber and his team back in the 1950s and 1960s, which, as David said, lay, laid the foundations for uh, the idea that there could be this war on cancer, that we would finally find the right combinations of the right drugs to treat all cancers. And treatment for childhood leukemia is several different drugs applied in really specific time intervals that aim to sort of reduce populations, bring them down to the right level, and then kind of give the knockout killer blow that finally gets rid of them all. And this combination of the right time, the right drugs, the right order, was happened upon through lots and lots of trial and error, and sadly, lots and lots of children's lives along the way. But now we can start thinking about much more rational strategies. We know we have so many different drugs. We know how they work. We can apply things like um, machine learning, data science, genomics, evolutionary biology to really start to devise extinction strategies for cancer. And I think that that is incredibly exciting. So before I quickly wrap up, there's one thing I do want to, to talk about is all the way through this book, as soon as you start talking about cancer, people are like, well, what about the cure? Where's the cure? We've been working on this problem for 100 years. Cancer Research UK was founded in, in 1902. So this is um, more than a century of research, and we still don't have a the cure for cancer. And that's because there will never be one cure for cancer. Cancer is almost, it's a unique genetic disease in every person where it occurs. Cancer cells in every single person go on their own evolutionary journey. There are going to be, we're going to need lots of different treatments applied in smart ways. Um, there are very exciting things like immunotherapies, which use the immune system to tackle cancer cells. And I think they are incredibly exciting, but they don't work for everyone. And in some cases, they can actually suddenly make cancers an awful lot worse because the immune system is a tricky beast. Um, and we need to be very careful when we unlock its power against cancer. But, you know, in, in the popular imagination, we've been sold this idea that there is the cure, that it's somewhere out there, and that, you know, if we could just find it, we could get rid of all cancers. But cancer will always be with us. It is a deep biological phenomenon that emerges from multicellular life. We can be a lot smarter about the ways that we encourage it or discourage it in our bodies. And we can also be a lot smarter about the strategies that we use to treat it. But you know, you can no more declare war on cancer than you can declare war on evolution or war on multicellularity. It, it just is a nonsense. And ultimately, and this is maybe a slightly strange note to end on, but when, um, when I was researching the book, I went to talk to a lot of scientists all over the world, and, and I was talking to um, Peter Campbell, who's a very eminent cancer geneticist, and I, he's at the Wellcome Sanger Institute in Cambridge, and I said, well, what's, like, what's the end game here? You know, if we do manage to control cancers or, or you know, drive them to extinction, like, what's, what's the end game? And he's like, well, you know, I guess it's that you live long enough to die of something else first. And, you know, the more I, I write about health and, and cancer and all kinds of diseases in my, in my job, I'm a professional science communicator, you know, human lifespan is finite. We all have to die of something. But, you know, having witnessed firsthand the impact that cancer has on, on families, on friends, uh, people losing loved ones, people living long term with the after effects, of treatment. You know, I want to see a world, we can't ever hope to see a world where there is never any cancer. It's just a biological impossibility. But where we live long, healthy lives, where this is a disease that is controllable, um, in some cases curable, that's what I'd like to see, where people are not 
losing their lives in, in middle age, even late middle age, early old age, the older and older we can go living healthy, long, happy lives. Um, that's what I would really like to see. And that's what I would really like to hope for in the future. So thank you very, very much for your attention. Um, you can get my book. It is uh, available from all good and evil bookshops. And you can buy signed copies and some signed book plates. If you've already got a copy, you can get me uh, a nice sort of Darwinistic book plate uh, from rebelsubbook.com. And you can find me on Twitter. So thank you very much for your attention. Many thanks, Kat. There's so much there to think about. I want to the audience, uh, it's now a chance for you to think which questions you would like to put into the discussion. Somewhere down below, you'll find a Q&A uh, little icon. If you type your questions in there, then it will allow the audience as a whole to vote on which questions are most interesting. And people can vote in that window by hovering their mouse over the thumbs up and clicking it. So I see four questions already. I'm sure more will arrive. And I will tend to take the ones that have been voted most highly. From me first, Kat, you mentioned that there are some animals that seem not to have cancer. A very few sponges and uh, some kinds of jellyfish. There are other animals possibly elephants or whales that uh, don't seem to have cancer anything like as much as often as we might expect given their great size. Are scientists looking at these animals to see if we can learn what their secret is and to what extent that will inform uh, treatments for humans? Absolutely and I, I think this is so fascinating. There's quite a big chunk of the book where I'm looking at uh, cancer through the animal kingdom and what we can learn from it. And there's a really interesting thing called Pito's paradox, which is at work here, which is the fact that um, if cancer is purely a function of cells going wrong, you would expect that very long lived and very large animals, right? They're made of lots and lots of cells that are multiplying lots of times and are around for a very long time. You would expect that very big animals would have much higher rates of cancer. And in fact, it's the opposite. So very large, long-lived animals like uh, whales, like elephants, um, and to some extent humans, you know, we do not have as many cancers as you might expect compared to actually very small rodents, very high chance of developing cancer. Mice and rats do get a lot of cancers. But this is, again, the other evolutionary aspect is about the evolution of the kind of the lifestyle um, the reproductive lifestyle of these species. So small animals tend to go for like a live fast and die young approach. So they're going to live for a very short time, they're going to produce lots of offspring, um, and then it's on to the next generation. And so they don't have, they haven't evolved very good protective mechanisms in their tissues. Um, they heal very fast, but that's at the risk. If, you, if your cells are constantly like, oh, we could proliferate right now, uh, you're much closer to becoming a cancer. Whereas something like a giant tortoise, um, one of the researchers I spoke to is, is researching this exact phenomenon and she wanted to get hold of some skin from a giant tortoise and she went to the zoo and was like, can you just do a little skin punch, can you just get a small sample of skin? And the zoo were like, no, nope, because that giant tortoise will take a year to heal. So animals, like, animals that are, have very low incidence of cancer, they have used different mechanisms. So elephants, we know, have lots of copies of a gene called P53. That means that as soon as their cells are damaged, their cells just die. And like if you're an elephant, you kind of got cells to burn, right? So as soon as an elephant cell is damaged, it just dies. Um, naked mole rats live for a very long time. They have some really unusual characteristics, several mechanisms that help to protect themselves. Um, uh, capybaras, very, very big guinea pigs. Um, have a surprisingly low rate of cancer. They've evolved some things in their immune system. Their immune systems are very good at patrolling and removing dodgy cells from their body. Um, bats, Brown's bats live for about 40 years and they've evolved a way of kind of uh, putting the caps on the ends of their chromosomes to enable their cells to multiply more often before they're likely to become damaged. So there's all sorts of things that we can learn about how animals um, either live, uh, either have a very high risk of cancer or a very low risk of cancer. And it's, it's an absolutely fascinating area of biology, for sure. You mentioned that uh, evolution is the survival of the fittest in a given environment. And you mentioned that the environment of possible cancerous cells inside the body changes over time that possibly when we are relatively young, the environment isn't so conducive to cancerous cells, but as we are older, somehow that environment encourages more 
cancerous growth. Well, what is it? Do we know what's changing in the environment? Is it that the immune system has got weakened? Are there other aspects that are understood? So this is where the science of cancer really intersects with the science of aging. Um, and I would highly recommend if people are interested in this, there's a really nice kind of companion book to my book, which is called Ageless. It's a book by Andrew Steele that's just come out. And, um, and, and that's kind of the flip side, because as our bodies age, our tissues change. So, you know, young tissue, uh, sort of, you can describe it as like, it's buff, like our cells are tightly stuck together. Um, our immune systems are very active and good at spotting things that are going wrong and getting rid of it. Um, we have very low levels of inflammation. All of these things change. And also, as our cells are picking up the, the kind of mutations that I described, even if they're not cancerous, they may be affecting the ability of our cells to do their jobs normally. So, you know, everything does start to go downhill as you get older. Your tissues do start to become less well glued together. We start to see chronic inflammation, long-term inflammation that alters um, the tissues. We see reduced function in the immune system. So, you know, this is, this is why when I think about cancer prevention, we spend a lot of time thinking about what's gone wrong, what makes us ill, and we don't think a lot about what keeps us well. And in terms of tissue biology, it's like, what actually is healthy tissue and how do we maintain that? And that's proper cancer prevention. How do you maintain your tissue health? So, um, you know, when I talk in the book a lot about preventing cancer, so one, of course, is like, don't add to your mutational burden. Like, don't do things that we know increase the mutations in your tissues. Things like smoking, things like UV exposure, um, excessive x-rays, you know, chemicals, toxic chemicals that can damage DNA, things like that, right? Don't add to your mutational burden. But also, keep your tissues healthy. And one of the really interesting things is that we know that people who are physically active, who do more physical activity, have reduced risk of cancer. We don't know why. Some people say, well, it's because, you know, it keeps your weight down. And we know that um, if you're more overweight, your, your risk of cancer is also higher. We don't understand why physical activity is protective. We don't understand why having more body fat is a, an increased risk, right? And I think this is really to do with tissue health. Um, physical activity helps to improve the health of your tissues. Um, having lots of body fat is producing hormones and molecules that disrupt your tissue health. So, you know, this is really understanding. It's not just like, oh, specific foods, eat these berries, don't eat these things. It's like, okay, what's keeping our tissues healthy for as long as possible? And how can we maybe find interventions or maybe ultimately drugs or, or some kind of interventions that help to increase tissue health for a long time? Just to follow on from that, and this will be the last question from me before I promise I will dig into the audience questions. This possibility of preventing a cancer, uh, keeping ourselves healthy uh, rather than uh, trying to cure cancers at already a fairly advanced stage. So well, why do you think the balance is that there's a lot of research into late stage drugs and possibly not enough research uh, into prioritizing understanding what prevents cancer in the first place and how it could be detected early when easy cures are still possible? Money is <laughs> the simple answer. Um, money. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm not a sort of a tinfoil hat conspiracist um, at all, but I think that the incentives in the, the system and in the pharmaceutical industry and in the political system and in the research system um, are skewed against prevention. Um, it's also prevention is difficult, right? Because any prevention intervention, you need to do studies that are following people for years, many, many people, lots and lots of people. You need to work out like if we're starting to measure tissue health, how do we measure that? And also if you're going to give people, um, particularly when you start thinking about things like preventive drugs, if you're going to give someone a drug that should be preventive, you need to be really sure that that is not going to cause problems and, and you're going to have to monitor people for a very, very long time. So this research is difficult. Um, you need lots of, lots of money, lots of people, lots of time to do it. But there may not be something that you can sell at the end of it. And the incentives in our, in, you know, the uh, industrial oncogene <laughs> complex um, 
you know, the sort of oncogene pharmaceutical industrial complex are skewed towards companies that can develop specific drugs for specific cancers that will uh, be used at a specific point in treatment and potentially unlock millions and millions of dollars in market access. So, you know, and there's very little incentive for companies to actually develop, even develop the kinds of drugs that will prolong survival or be used in these kind of, you know, more evolutionary ways because there's no financial incentive for them to do so. Um, the current system we have of drug approvals and drug trials, you've just got to get your drug over the line and show it's a little bit better than the next best option. And then your drug can go to market. So, you know, there's, there's lots of things that could be better, um, but really it comes down to like the incentives in the system and also the funding in the system as well. Well, that takes me to a question from Jose Cordero, who's actually in Madrid. It's about funding. So Jose talks about the warp speed operation to change the direction and incentives for developing vaccines. I mean, as we know, vaccines aren't particularly profitable for most companies. If you spend a long time developing them, and most of them don't work, and you only use them once or twice, possibly. But warp speed operation was government-directed uh, additional funding. So why not, Jose asks, why not propose now a global warp speed operation against cancer? Does that make sense? Yeah, I, there, I mean, that is what's been going on for 100 years, you know, and the, Nixon's war on cancer was part of that, you know, the founding of organizations like um, the predecessor of Cancer Research UK, the Imperial Cancer Research Fund, like there has been enormous global effort, you know, that you look up all the money that's been spent on cancer research over the past decades, probably just would dwarf the amount of money that's even been put into COVID research or into the COVID vaccine development. Um, it's just because it's been done for so long by so many organizations, companies, governments, charities. Um, you know, they, it has been going on. It's not warp speed, but there has been really phenomenal effort and progress. Um, but yeah, I think what was interesting about uh, the vaccine was that there was just like, that's all that everyone's doing right now. And actually, there's a more serious issue that a lot of cancer trials have had to stop and a lot of cancer research has had to stop and the funding for cancer charities has plummeted. So, you know, it, it does kind of come down to money and time and incentives. Um, but there is huge effort going on around the world into, into cancer and it is accelerating. So I think, you know, it's not quite the super urgent warp speed like crap. We basically can't open the world again until we've got a vaccine for COVID. Um, but yeah, there's... And it kind of comes back to where the incentives are, that I think that there does, there could be much more of a realignment of where the money goes and in which stages of the, the cancer journey um, that money is invested. But, you know, ultimately, if the incentives are that if you can get your drug over the line, over to approval and onto the market, and you can unlock millions of dollars, I mean, companies are not stupid, right? that's where they're going to invest their time and their effort and because they get returns. And, you know, ultimately you can blame late stage capitalism if you really want, you know, let's blame Darwinism and late stage capitalism. Um, but yeah, we could, we could do more to change the models of how we fund cancer research and, and, you know, where, where in the pathway drugs are developed and, and the survival gains that come from them. Is it different elsewhere in the world is if, Maybe China is practicing late stage capitalism as well. I don't know. But <laughs> is uh, funding for cancer research in some other large countries or different, or is it basically the same with the world over? It's basically the same. And, and actually, you know, I've sort of, I kind of jest a bit, but one of the problems as well is that moving towards a deeper understanding of cancer and how we treat it as a tissue phenomenon, as an evolutionary phenomenon, is going to be hard, right? We've had this colossal era, we've had two decades of the genomic revolution where we've had massive plummet of costs in DNA sequencing. Um, you can have a tumor, you can have it sequenced, you can get a list of drugs that you should give someone. And that is where everyone is getting really excited. This is how we're gonna treat cancer. Ultimately, once your cancer is advanced enough, those drugs are going to fail because of evolution, right? So where are the incentives to come up with the integrated pest management strategy for cancer? You should have a failure plan. You should assume that these drugs are going, that cancers will become resistant to them. So what do you do next? How do you use these drugs? How do you test different combinations? Companies are really bad at playing together. Like, 
you know, oh, I've got my drug. Oh, I'm not going to work with you to test your drug as well. Um, you know, there are some really skewed incentives that, that fight against what is actually best for patients in terms of developing better therapeutic um, regimens. And that is the same everywhere. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's easy to do genomics. And China has actually invested hugely in genomic and genetic technologies and sequencing and all this kind of stuff. But to really understand tissue biology, the emergence of resistance, you know, these, these are problems that everyone is facing. And so we, we've all got to start digging into them. There's another question about funding options. This is by Roman Bauer, who I think is at the University of Surrey. Since age is the biggest risk factor in most cancer types, do you think the proportion of government funding spent on aging versus cancer should be increased? I think they're two sides of the same coin because cancer is a disease of aging and cancer is a disease of mutational burden, of inflammation, of aging, right? So if you are going to study aging, cancer is kind of part of it. Um, so, you know, I've, I had a really interesting chat with, with Andrew Steele, who's written this sort of ageless book. And like, they're, they're two sides of the same coin. You know, really understanding what's driving cancer, what's causing cancer, how we can stop it from emerging. That is also aging. You know, it's, it's the same thing. Um, I think that aging research hasn't had so much interest uh, because everyone has been focusing on let's treat the cancers that have emerged. So bringing that all back downstream to these processes of, of mutation, of selection within the body, um, that is basically aging research as well, because you have these this same processes of mutation and change and all these kind of things are driving other diseases of aging too. You know, cancer is not, cancer is not the only disease of old age, unfortunately. There's a question by Alan Bolton about the mutation patchwork that you uh, described, which was uh, probably new for lots of people in the audience. So you say that most people actually by, I don't know, early middle age have got lots of uh, mutation patchworks in the esophagus, in the skin. Do we understand why that isn't problematic for people at that age? Yeah, so this is, this is kind of what I was saying about, it's not just about the genes, it's about the environment. So, you know, when you're, when you're younger, your tissues are a much tighter, healthier, more, if, you know, policed by the immune system environment. So dodgy cells in a robust environment are not fit. They don't fit in that environment, so they do not thrive. But dodgy cells in a dodgy aging environment are a better fit and can thrive. So this is, like I say, this is why we really need to understand what is tissue health? What is special about younger tissue? What keeps our tissues healthier for longer to control these cells? But yeah, the, the idea as well is that, you know, it's not just about the risk of cancer, that as we accumulate these mutations in our body, they will affect the function of our cells. That's not necessarily to say that every cell is gonna become a cancer cell, because we know that doesn't happen. But this mutational burden will influence, you know, how, how we age as well, just generally. So it's, I think it's, it's been a really fascinating field that um, there's a lot of work. I've just done a podcast. Um, I do a podcast called Genetics Unzipped. And um, so I did interview Andrew Steele, my current favorite person, um, but also a researcher called Rahela Rabare from the Wellcome Sanger Institute, who's doing this work on mutational load throughout different tissues of the body. And you know, that different parts of the body have different amounts of mutation. And this is not just humans. This is, we can look at other species. You can find this in animals and even plants. And this is fascinating, right? Um, the leaves of plants have more mutations than the stems of plants. So the, the bits that have to hang around for a long time have, uh, have mechanisms that protect against mutations compared to the leaves that are just gonna fall off. And when you look in the human body, you can see, um, and Rahel has discovered that, for example, there are more mutations in the bowel where you have cells that are constantly being renewed and shed. You know, the bowel lining is renewed every few days. Lots of mutations in there, because it doesn't really matter. You're just gonna poop it all out, right? But the testicles, much lower mutational burden because what's in there? Germ cells, the cells that are going to become sperm that are going to pass on to the next generation. So that's a tissue where you really want to suppress mutations, whereas the, uh, the bowel, it's not so important. So this is like, this is really emerging science and it's absolutely fascinating. 
What's the advice on low carbohydrate diets, which are said to slow tumor growth? Do you think that's likely to be a significant factor? Um, there's a lot of stuff about diet and cancer and treating diet with cancer, uh, treating cancer with diet and these kind of things. And there's not a lot of really robust evidence. Um, so that for a start, the other thing is what is important is that not all cancers are the same. Every cancer is unique and going on its own unique genetic and evolutionary journey. And so um, we also know, for example, and this works in animal populations as well, that if you apply a selective pressure, like cutting off a certain food source or reducing a particular nutrient, that can be a selective pressure that can actually encourage migration, encourage like, you know, these cells to go out and try and migrate more in search of more food. So, you know, doing things like very restrictive diets, altering diets, we just don't know what the impact is. And it may well be very different for different cancers in individuals, depending on the kinds of mutations and the kinds of cells that are in there. So I think, you know, these blanket things like all cancer patients should have a low carb diet. Cancer patients shouldn't, you know, shouldn't eat this, do eat that. It, it's, it, it's, for a start, it's dangerous because there's a risk that when someone is ill and going through treatment, they need nutrition. And one of the biggest problems for people being treated with cancer is, is losing weight, is losing their appetite and not actually getting the nourishment they need for their body to fight their disease. So, you know, I think restrictive diets are unhelpful. Um, you know, the people who should be giving advice on diets should be registered dietitians and qualified people to do that. Um, but also there's simply not the evidence to make any kind of blanket recommendations on this diet or that diet or this supplement and that supplement and all these kind of things because individual cancers are different and people are different. So, you know, it's, I, I think it's a not massively helpful um, area and we certainly don't know enough. Right, so we're slightly misled by just seeing cancer as a disease and tuberculosis as a disease and smallpox as a disease, whereas these other things I mentioned generally are fairly uh, single, and there may be some variants, but on the whole, there is a particular course that's needed for each of tuberculosis or smallpox, whereas with cancer, there are a vast variety of different uh, aspects, and so bludgeoning a simple-minded solution into this a general case may be counterproductive. Exactly. You know, it's, it's, it's just, there's complexity. And it's difficult because we want answers and we want, do this, don't do that. You know, we want, we want rules, but it's, it's a complex system. Um, and one of the things I do argue for, and I, I use the word holistic, which is frustrating because it's sort of been claimed by the kind of alt med side of things but like a more holistic understanding of this disease as a, a systemic uh disease that's like a system of cells an evolution evolving system of cells in a body that's subject to you know our circadian rhythms our, our body clock it's subject it is subject to you know what we put into our bodies what we do the hormones that are circulating our immune systems our tissues you know, moving away from this idea that like you just focus on the genetic changes in the cancer and just target those. But this is a, a holistic disease of the whole body. Um, and we need to sort of start understanding that. That last question, by the way, on low carb diets was by Hugh Shields. A follow up on lifestyle choices generally. This is a question again from Alan Bolton. And you've mentioned some things that we should avoid doing that to inject uh, the risks of mutations. And do you have other general proactive lifestyle choices that you think, although it's not going to guarantee no cancers, will reduce the probability? Yeah, so it's kind of like I say, like there's two aspects to cancer prevention. So one is don't, don't add unnecessarily to your mutational burden. And so we know many things that can cause mutations. And there's some really interesting work that's actually going on to try and pin that down. So there's, this is, again, it's a work from the Sanger Institute, um, who are just doing really incredible work in this area. Um, and it's a project called the Mutographs of Cancer, where they're looking at thousands of tumors from all over the world in different types of cancer, looking at the DNA and looking for like, you can kind of see the scars of different types of damage left in the DNA of tumors, and then mapping that back onto different causes. Um, importantly, many of these signatures that they find, they kind of almost like the fingerprints of, of culprits for damage, are just the processes of life. 
So, you know, there's, there's certain processes of DNA replication every time your cells divide that causes massive damage to your cells. Uh, it causes a lot of mutations. There's not a lot we can do about that. Um, there's lots of biological processes that they're discovering that are just internal to our cells, that we can see the fingerprints of, of damage in cancers. Um, but we do obviously see things like the fingerprints of tobacco, of UV radiation from the sun. They're looking at, um, one of the really interesting things is there's a chemical called uh, aristolochic acid, which is found in certain herbs. Um, it was found in some Chinese herbs, actually some cases of cancer pinned down to that. Um, and it's found in this sort of weed that grows in wheat fields in certain parts of Central Europe. And you can see like clusters of um, kidney cancers in this area that they look at the kidney cancers and they find the signatures of this chemical. So, you know, you can start to match the things that we start to see evidence of damage in tumours to chemicals, things in the environment, um, you know, like I say, the processes of life. So that's one thing. So don't do things that we know add to your mutational burden. And then on the flip side, try and do things that we know protect the health of your tissues. And this, I'm afraid, is kind of like the, the boring stuff, like, um, you know, stay a healthy weight, exercise, eat a balanced diet with lots of fruit and veg, and, you know, don't drink too much. There's, there's nothing magic about it. There's not anything special you know, these are the kind of things that we know reduce the risk of cancer and they reduce the risk of cancer by keeping your body healthier. Uh, not just the risk of cancer, they reduce your risk of heart disease and all these kinds of things. So, you know, do the things that we know keep bodies healthy and then don't add to your mutational burden. Well, from something you've described as being a bit boring, which of course, <laughs> I'm not sure that's, that might be true. Maybe it's, it's boring because our grandmothers might have told us the same advice. This uh, technology that the audience seems to be pretty interested in, which is the technology of CRISPR gene editing. So do you have a views as to whether something like CRISPR could help accelerate improved treatment by editing the affected cells and uh, stopping their propagation? Uh, no, 100% no. Because um, the problem with CRISPR, when you start talking about using CRISPR gene therapy, it's all very exciting. Cancer cells are really, really, really messed up right? There is not a fix in the world that could sort out by the time you can detect a tumor, those chromosomes are a mess, right? Those, there's, there's not a, a, a gene edit in the world that could fix that. You'd want to take out all the DNA and just start again. And at that point, you're better off just get rid of the cells, right? So CRISPR as a way of, you know, editing cancer cells. So for a start, there aren't the changes that you can make. It's impossible. Um, for a second, the problems with these technologies are you have to get it into every single cell. And, you know, we're, the problem with cancer therapy is that we don't treat every single cell. So if a cancer is disseminated throughout the whole body, how on earth are you going to make specific changes, which is what CRISPR is? CRISPR is really targeted changes. How are you going to get it into every cell and do the right edits? And also, all your cancer cells are different. They have evolved. They're one cancer cell sitting next to another cancer cell will have a slightly different genetic changes. So this is just, it's, I don't know, whoever is talking about this, th th that approach is nonsense for the reasons that I've explained. It's cool and everyone's very excited, but as soon as you really unpack it about what we know about cancer, it's a non-starter. But what is really exciting is when you start to think about what can we apply CRISPR to in terms of the new immunotherapies. So taking things like immune cells that can be trained to recognize cancer and destroy cancer cells, and that's incredibly powerful. And we can start thinking about how do we use CRISPR to turn these cells into kind of cancer super soldiers that can recognize all these different cancer cells in the body. So I think that's where the applications of CRISPR and gene editing are really exciting, where we start talking about editing immune cells um, and those kinds of things is, is really incredibly exciting, yeah. So that was a, a good question from David Appleyard and a good answer, uh, many thanks. So on the probabilities of mutations, I think it's worth digging into this a little bit more. Lawrence Ion has a question about if a tumor has lots of cells in it, 10 to the 12, for example, and the probability of a mutation is pretty small, one in 10 to the five, we shouldn't need that many therapies to control it. And that, that presumes a relatively static state of affairs. But I think your understanding is that things change much more than that once we end up in the downward slope. Yeah, so that does assume that all cells have 
all the same three mutations or whatever. So if you're saying, oh, well, three therapies is enough, that's assuming that all cells are going to work with those therapies, um, which may not be the case. And um, particularly once cancers are diverse enough and particularly the advanced cancers, like millions and millions and millions of cells and, and disseminated through the body and highly heterogeneous genetically. But, you know, this is the principle of combination chemotherapy. And there is a lot of interest in cocktails of different chemotherapy drugs. And I actually do talk about it in the book quite a bit about how researchers are just trying to expand the, the therapeutic space, the kinds of places where we look for therapies. Um, one of the biggest problems we really have is the range of cancer treatments we have. It's kind of like, it's a bag of spanners. Everything's a spanner. You've got maybe a couple of hammers in there and a wrench, but we've got a lot of spanners. But we need much more diverse tools that tackle different processes so that we can have this combination approach. But ultimately, with multiple drugs, all drugs have side effects. And the challenge with cancer is that this is a disease that is of our bodies. It is our cells and it is therefore very close to our cells. When you're thinking about treating something like a viral infection or a bacterial infection, viruses and bacteria are very different to human cells. Um, cancer cells are very, very similar to human cells. They use all the same pathways to make energy and do all these kinds of things. So that's why if you're going to give someone drugs that kill cells, human cancer cells, they're going to have an impact on the other human cells. And there's something called the therapeutic window um, that is the, the, you know, at what level can you give someone a drug that's going to kill the cancer cells, but not kill the patient? And this is basically the balance that we have to make in cancer treatment is how do we treat enough to get rid of the cancer and not so much that we kill all the healthy cells as well. And this is why all cancer treatments have side effects. Um, and then when you start to add the different side effects and toxicities of multiple drugs together at once, that start, that window gets very, very small. So, you know, you can go, oh, it'd be wonderful to have all these amazing combinations and just add five drugs, six drugs. It's like that, the toxicity is, is unsustainable. There's only so much chemistry a human body can take. So yes, it's interesting. And I think rational, smart combinations and particularly drugs that do target very different mechanisms um, is certainly, certainly interesting, but, um, but a, a challenge in, in pharmacological terms. There's quite a lot of interest in immune treatments. Iwa Chodorowska asks, why generally isn't there more a discussion about the importance of a healthy immune system? Seems to be little public education in this area. Is it because there's no money to be made out of boosting the immune system or is it more complicated? <laughs> it's more complicated than that. So, you know, in recent years, the big breakthrough in cancer has been immunotherapy. So um, these drugs, we call them things like checkpoint inhibitors. These are basically drugs that kind of unmask cancer to the immune system. Cancer is amazing at hiding from the immune system. And kind of by definition, a cancer that has grown to the point where it can be detected and it is becoming a problem is a cancer that has evolved evaded the immune system. So these immunotherapies, they kind of reveal, <laughs> they do the big reveal. It's like, it's here, get it. Um, so they reveal the cancer to the immune system and it can be attacked. This doesn't work for everyone. At the moment, they work for about one in five patients who receive them. Um, and there, there are characteristics of tumors that we know increase the chances of, um, of immunotherapies working. So we do need to understand a lot more about the interaction of immune cells and cancer cells. And there's a huge amount of research going on in there because, you know, these drugs are absolute game changers for the people they work for. And, and in some cases, you know, they haven't been uh, around for that long, but people are seemingly apparently cured. Now, what we don't know is the long-term impact of messing with your immune system. Um, because people are now living, you know, four, five, six years without cancer as a result of these treatments, but we don't know what's the impact further down the line. Maybe there won't be, and this will be absolutely fantastic. Um, but generally, um, the immune system is a very complex beast, and there's a lot we still don't understand about it. We don't understand, um, you know, the role of the immune system in patrolling the body. Like, how can we encourage our immune cells to spot and remove damaged, uh, damaged cells or cells that are becoming cancerous? That's a really interesting question. Um, but there's also a lot of absolute guff talked about, like, boost your immune system with this and that. And it's pretty much universally nonsense. Um, so it's like, oh, boost your immune system to fight cancer. It's like, how, what, which bits? It, it's usually um, nonsense, I, I have to say.
Because uh, the, the risk of autoimmune diseases, amongst other things. Well, that's the thing. You don't, you know, boosting your immune system means having a massive allergic reaction or immune overreaction. You know, that's, we have to be really careful when we're talking about the immune system. There's hundreds of different types of immune cells. There's all sorts of different molecules that our cells use to talk to each other, to recognize damaged or infected cells. So, you know, this is a complicated thing. Um, and certainly the immunotherapies are very interesting. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's an emerging field, I would say. How important do you think the degraded immune system is to the overall observ observed fact that uh, aging uh, increases the likelihood of cancer? Do you think that maybe 50% of the, that increased uh, likelihood of aging is, might be due to a weaker immune system or 10% or 90% or... I mean, that's a hard question, but that's by P yeah, no, it's, it's a hard, it's a hard, I, I, I wouldn't like to put any kind of figures on it. Um, certainly, you know, my, my top suspicion is that inflammation and declining immune function are two really important things that change the tissue environment as we age and enable like, you know, dodgy cells to become fitter in that environment. But I, I, putting numbers on it as I'm, I'm not equipped to do that now. And the greater infl inflammation, the inflammaging as it's sometimes called, is partly due to more senescent cells being around the body and the senescent cells are crying out to the immune system, please come along and uh, hoover us up. But the immune system isn't particularly strong as we get older and so the more and more messages and it uh, causes inflammation, maybe that uh, increases cancer as well. Exactly. And, you know, in, in Andrew's book, he talks a lot about this process of in, inflammaging, inflammaging. Um, and, th and that's what I mean, you know, it's these, these two topics completely intersect, like the, the biological changes of aging intersect with the processes of cancer. Um, so they're, they're kind of two sides of the, the same thing. I should mention that we had Andrew as a speaker recently, and uh, his uh, talk is available in the YouTube channel for London Futurists, which, yes, I thoroughly recommend as well. The final question on the immune system. What about the new technology, which is talked about a lot these days, mRNA vaccine deliveries? You know, we've suddenly realized there's new ways to put mm -hmm. vaccines into the body to help the immune system. Is this likely to have any impact on cancer? This is by Francis Remedios. So, um, yes. Very exciting. Um, and actually, so uh, the recent episode of Genetics Unzip, the first one we did in January, is all about the history of mRNA and the history of mRNA vaccines. And actually, mRNA vaccines were first developed um, in, so they were, the, they, um, so mRNA as a kind of technology, as a health technology, was being developed as a way, a sort of alternative to DNA based gene therapy. It was thought to be a bit safer. And then people started realizing, it's like, oh, maybe we could use this as a kind of a vaccine. And initially it was for cancer. So it was the idea that you could somehow, um, yeah, trick the body into recognizing this, this code. MRNA, mRNA is a genetic code that tells the cells to make something. So maybe you could have an mRNA that makes something that's in the cancer cells and you'll trick the immune system into recognizing and destroying these cancer cells. And this is an idea that's been around, you know, for the best part of 20, 30 years. Um, there had to be some really significant advances in technology to make mRNA vaccines of any kind work. And so there's you know, there's been two parallel strands of mRNA vaccines for infectious diseases and mRNA vaccines for cancer. And so, you know, this, this idea of cancer vaccines, so this is not vaccines that stop you from getting cancer, but it's the idea of a vaccine that enables the immune system to recognize and destroy cancer cells. So I think that that is, and particularly now through the COVID vaccines, you know, it's really got this technology nailed. It's been a massive proof of principle that this stuff works, that it is safe, how you deliver it. There's been huge advances in kind of the nano encapsulation of mRNA, the delivery mechanisms, just of the code itself. There's really clever things in like swapping out some of the letters, the bases in the code um, for ones that then don't trigger um, things like, you know, immune reactions that you don't want. So it's, it's phenomenal technology. So go and check out uh, the Genetics Unzipped podcast episode about that if you want to know a bit more. But yeah, as, um, as cancer vaccines, it's, it's definitely an exciting area. Um, still, I'd say in the very research phase at the moment, though. So people should simply Google Genetics Unzipped. Yeah, you can find it. Um, if I get a minute, I will see if I can grab the link and pop it in the chat. But... Fine. And that takes me to, I think, will have to be the last question, which I'm going to 
ask you to put on a futurist hat. A question from Jose Codero, which has got more votes than any of the others. So what do you think the most promising new cancer treatments will be in 10 years time? So in 10 years time, I think, I think immunotherapies will probably be the most exciting treatments. Um, there's a lot of things to assume in there, um, but I think they will be very exciting. The knowledge generally of the immune system is, is moving really, really, really fast. And this whole field of immune oncology is really going big, big guns. Um, so I think that's definitely an area to watch. Um, actually, what we just talked about, this idea of like mRNA vaccines, I think is a very exciting area and it, it ties into the immune system. Um, things like adding in these like, you know, modified cells that can seek out, modified immune cells that can seek out and destroy cancers. So I think this whole area of immunotype treatments for cancer is going to be very, very exciting. Um, and that's going to be a big shift. So, uh, and does that yeah. shift depend upon fixing some of the incentives which are governing how the, what did you call it, the onco industrial uh, <laughs> complex? Yeah, the onco yeah, pharmaceutical oncogene industrial complex. Right. Um, yes, I think that that is also going to be an issue, and especially for um, treatments that are not curative. What's interesting with immunotherapies is that some of them certainly do seem to be curative which is absolutely incredible like the cancer does not come back um, but at the moment they, they don't work for everyone and, and they're not always successful so that that's an important caveat um, but yeah I think that trying to work towards a better balance of incentives where it really is about survival benefits it's about quality of life on these treatments as well that that should really be taken into account um, you know I think that that's very important too. So, you know, that's going to be for, for health services and the people who are paying for these treatments um, to really say, you know, this, these are the things that we care about. It's for regulators to say these are the things that we care about and we will not approve your drug unless you can show how you use it and the, the you know, what you do when people become resistant to it. So this is, um, you know, these are big, big systemic challenges at the level of government regulators, of funders, of investors, of the research community and patients asking for this and, and the medical community too and healthcare services all, all around and certainly in countries where they have it, the insurance system as well, which is a whole other um, world of problem, um, which we don't have time to unpack here. But yeah, there's, there's many, many big organisations with sort of misaligned incentives that could be improved, I'd say. So as well as engineering or re-engineering what's going on inside the physical body, we need to re-engineer some of the structural incentives for, as you say, insurance, comp insurance corporations and other players in the wider ecosystem. Yeah, absolutely. I think the regulators, um, and particularly in the US, the regulators are sort of priding themselves on how many drugs they approve because that's what patients want. Pa patients want more cures. They want more cures. They want more treatments. You know, the, there's a, we want more ways to treat cancer and better treatments and more survival. So there's a big incentive on companies to get it over the line. There's a big incentive on regulators to approve it in countries where you have insurance based healthcare. There's a big incentive for insurers to, you know, pay for it because they got loads of money to pay for it and doctors to prescribe it so you know there there are some really big systemic challenges i think in the way that cancer is treated um which I, again i don't go into in a lot of detail in the book because that's a whole other problem um a guy called vinay prasad who's excellent cancer commentator he has a podcast called plenary session he's written a book called malignant which is all about that intersection of cancer and policy and healthcare. So this is really sort of, it's, it's not my area, but it, that's kind of where the, a lot of the sticky problems are. So I'd, I'd check out his book as well. Malignant. I think it's called Malignant, yes. Well, we'll look it up and we'll put it into By Vinay Prasad, yeah. Oh, fantastic. I did look at the YouTube uh, play as well. Somebody called Tom Richards says he's been listening to you for a decade or so <laughs> on uh, a podcast called Naked Genetics. Is that right? Yes. He asks what's happened to that. Is it still going on or is it uh, uh, finished? So it's, it's now Genetics Unzipped. So, so it has um, changed its branding. 
Yes, so, well, the Naked Genetics podcast was um, from the Naked Scientists. Um, I'm no longer part of the Naked Scientists Collective, so now we Naked uh, Genetics Unzipped is the new genetics podcast. So you have a treat in store because we have over two years of episodes for you to catch up on um, if you go to geneticsunzipped.com. So, um, and we do actually, there's some episodes last year, you can search for cancer episodes and we've got some excerpts from the book and some really interesting guests talking about the, the future of cancer. And uh, so check those out as well, if that's the kind of thing. Or we've just got loads of stories from the history of genetic science, amazing like cutting edge uh, guests, all sorts of really great people and um, interviews and stories. So do check that out if you're interested in hearing more of my voice and, uh, and more sciencey stuff. Well, I certainly enjoyed hearing your voice on the audio version of the book. Uh, so there's a lot more in the book that uh, you haven't had a chance to talk about. So uh, I see a few people in chat have uh, said they've bought the book as we've been chatting away. So that's good. Uh, Thank you. I'll just uh, briefly mention there's more coming from London Futurists all the time. Uh, next week, we're doing something quite different. It's not about putting uh, mRNA vaccines or similar things into your body. It's putting possible... NFC chips into your body so that we might uh, change how we interact with the environment. Uh, we might use it, for example, for payment mechanisms. So that event is called the Wallet of Tomorrow? Question mark. There's three or four other events that I hope to announce within a week or so. Please keep your eyes on the various channels. So Kat Arne, thank you so much for being such an informative and engaging presenter. Uh, this is such a big topic. Uh, I feel we understand it at least a bit better now. And I hope that others are encouraged to look more deeply into some of the links and references you've given. Thanks thank so you. much. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for your attention, everyone. It's been great. Thank you. Great.